It is my official pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to this very special presentation by member of the fourth floor, Nilima Akwal. And she is also the founder of the Female Founders Lab. And the Female Founders Lab is in fact a greater impact partner in our Pay It Forward initiative, which we will put some information in the chat about how you can nominate yourself and or nominate your employer and get involved. So Kat, if you can hear me, hopefully you will place that in the chat. Um, today, we are going to hear from Nilima. Um, uh, uh, she is going to share a feminine forward approach to up-level your pitch, to raise pre-seed seed capital and become a magnet for visibility and brand partnerships, which is just amazing information and incredibly valuable. Please, as Nilima said, keep yourselves muted and get your questions ready. Uh, I'm sure uh, Nilima will be doing a great job keeping an eye on the chat, but like questions I believe are welcome. So uh, please don't be shy. And then finally, just a brief word about uh, the fourth floor before we dive in. For those of you who don't know, uh, our mission is to get more women on boards and cap tables. And we're doing that by providing a place for women to initiate and advance for-profit board careers, earn equity, and invest, all by tapping into the underleveraged value of women entrepreneurs. And we are also all about helping women entrepreneurs access funding and growth opportunities. We're helping them do that by leveraging their advisory boards and their governing boards, also by seeking funding in our backroom investment club. So for those of you listening, if you are not yet a member of the fourth floor, please consider applying to join us. Founders, it is free if you, well, $1, as long as you are engaging and using our board seat exchange. And it can be listing just a mentor sponsor opportunity to qualify for that free membership. We, of course, encourage you to, to list all of your advisory and governing board opportunities in our fourth floor exchange. Um, but for, for founders, there is no cost. For candidates, there is a membership cost. Um, however, we will do everything in our power to help you get your employer to participate in the Pay It Forward initiative so that you don't have to cover that cost. We would like to offset all the costs onto corporate America where it belongs. Um, so, and if you are currently a member and you're paying a membership fee, talk to us, we'll help you um, do our best to help you get your employer to um, step in and cover that cost. So that's kind of the plug for our Pay It Forward initiative and for applying and joining us as members. Uh, the last thing I, I wanna mention that our Backroom Investment Club is new, but it's picking up steam. So if you are currently a member and you don't really know that's happening, it is happening. You can access it in our platform really easily just by going to the back room. You can apply either as a founder who's actively fundraising, if you wanna list yourself to get investment or as a member who's an accredited investor who's, you know, angel curious or LP curious, you can sign up and join there as well. And of course, you might be a founder that's also um, an, an investor curious and that that we welcome that. So just want to make sure everyone knows about the back room and that it's a resource and it's available to all of our members. And if you're not a member, it's another reason to join. So I think that's about it, except for just uh, making sure everyone knows that you can sign up for platform tours if you are curious, and we do them every week. You can just sign up, hear more about the fourth floor, see the platform. If you're a new member, come to a new member welcome hour if you haven't already. We also do board boot camps periodically. We have another one in June. If you've never come to board boot camp, whether you're a member or not, come to board boot camp. It's a really good just overview of what we're doing what the landscape is, how boards work. It's intended for both founders and candidates. So it's a good way to get acquainted. Um, we'll put the links to all of these things in the chat to make it easy for you. Okay, so that's enough about me and the fourth floor. Now I do wanna to get to the point of today why everyone is here, which is to hear from Nilima. <clears throat> so without further ado, Nilima, let me please turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Reen. Um, and it's been really fun being a part of this community so far. I'm a fairly new member, um, but we've also partnered with Fort Floor on the Pay It Forward initiative. So the founders who go through my accelerator can get access to your huge network as well. So, um, so it's nice to meet you guys. Like I, it's nice to meet like members. It's, I think it's the first time I'm interacting with um, members like 
in the community so far. So I'm really excited to get to know some of you and, um, and you know, your ventures and your stories and everything like that. Um, so this session is going to be part storytelling and part like the synthesis of uh, the learnings from my founder experience, which you can use when you're going to raise your first round of capital, um, whether that's like an angel or a pre-seed or a seed round. And I really focus on that early stage because I believe that there's a huge identity shift that takes place at that stage where you've been heads down and building and building and iterating on your product. And all of a sudden you have to turn 180 degrees and have this like crystal clear pitch to an external stakeholder, most of the times who has really doesn't understand your industry. Let's be real here. Like even if they're a VC in your industry, they're really not going to understand the intricacies of what you're facing um, with your customers and your product. And probably is not even going to realize like how amazing the traction that you have so far is. So how do we really anchor that story and tell it um, along with yourself, like as the steward of this vision um, in a way that's going to make you a magnet, that's going to make people want to join the party and step in and, and give you all the funding and, and all the opportunities that you deserve. Um, so one of the, okay, I see we have 28 people. This is amazing. I love seeing everyone's names on here, like such great energy. If you haven't so far, please put your name uh, and your city and whether you're a founder and what you're working on in the chat box. So I get a sense of who's in the room, um, but welcome. And so um, what I actually always do at the beginning of a session, nice Sterling, Deepa, NYC, founder, founder, Jennifer, founder, amazing. So I'm gonna be reading these. I'm actually gonna read all of it, but I'm not gonna like call it out, but just so you know, like um, I am reading it as we go along. So something I always do um, is that I like to take a collective breath at the beginning of a session. And that's because I believe that like, we're all actually here in this Zoom room and um, we're as much feeding off each other and the information that you're putting in the chat and the way that you're responding to my information as much as just me putting my energy out there. So we're just gonna take one deep breath together to just come into the space. Um, so let's just close our eyes and let's take a nice deep breath together in through the nose and out through the mouth. Thank you. So I have a couple of rules for this session. One is that I want you to think of this as an hour long thing. We, we're coming into this, we're in this together. And so turning off any notifications or tabs, phones, um, just for the, the purposes of the next hour. Um, and the second rule is like, please be super active in the chat box. Um, because the more that you're giving me, the more information I have to give you what is relevant to you at this stage of the journey. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. And I think you guys can see this, right? Screen? Okay, great. So I'm the founder of the female, my name is Nilima Achwal. I'm the founder of the Female Founders Lab. And we're a virtual accelerator, primarily for venture ideas that can transform industries. And so I really look at these really big uh, industries like healthcare and education and food systems and cities. And my conviction is that all of these systems are like slowly crumbling um, and they're so opaque and they're so outdated. And um, even if you look at the education sector, like it was built during the industrial revolution. So it was basically created to create factory workers out of children. 
And so it's like the entire world and the economy has shifted and these systems have not kept up. And something that I see repeatedly that it's women who have the lived experience of being in these industries um, who are actually coming up with the very cutting edge new paradigm solutions um, for, for our world and for our industries that can decentralize the value um, and really create an impact at scale for every stakeholder. Um, and so let me tell you how I got here. So this is me on stage at the Bombay Stock Exchange in August 2016, pitching my venture. And so when I'm, this is the dress rehearsal for the demo day for um, a, you know an elite accelerator I've been part of for the last six weeks in Mumbai, India. And um, this is like we were chosen as the top 12 ventures in the entire country. Um, and the last six weeks, we've literally been day and night, just like pouring my heart and soul into creating this pitch. And this is also culminating a few years of working on my venture, uh, which, is, which is focused on sex education in India. And at the time that I'm at the dress rehearsal for this demo day standing on stage, I'm pretty much almost out of cash. Like, let me know in the chat box if you know what this feels like as a founder. And so the stakes are high. Yeah, the stakes are high because I'm like, I need to raise around, otherwise this venture isn't going forward and scaling <laughs> so many yeses. It's not gonna go forward. And and so um so that's that's but let me tell you like how I got here. So I moved to India a few years before and um I launched and ran ran a seed stage accelerator that was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, quit my job. Um and this happened. There is a very highly publicized rape case that happened in Delhi in December 2013. And um, this is like was one of those watershed moments that we see in countries like we've had plenty of those in the US as well, where it's just there's just like mass protests. And there's this awakening moment where it's like, oh, wow, this is really a social issue. Like sexual violence is a thing. How do we solve it? And so then you see the response from the startup ecosystem, um, which is a lot of safety apps and like product solutions. And the response from the government NGO side is just like, we need better legislation. You know, we need better punishments for, for sexual violence. But the way that I function, it's always like at a systems level. It's like, how can we actually heal and transform this for the next generation? So I quit my job at the accelerator and I started Aisha Learning, which was my ed tech startup. And so I created a comprehensive sexual and gender education program that could be run for middle schoolers across the country. And my hypothesis was that if we give kids the right information at the right age, we can change the entire generation to be um, gender equal and have no taboos and be empathetic towards each other. Um, so I created the, you know, I hired a couple people, built the whole program, and then started doing pilots. So this is me doing a pilot in a Teach for India slum classroom. So this is a classroom that's so tiny that I have to walk in and go to the front and then all the kids have to come in and sit on the benches because the room is that tiny. It's like literally in the middle of a very clouded slum in Mumbai. And when the teachers called us, they were basically like, our eighth graders are so out of control that we can't teach the class. The boys are harassing the girls and the younger boys and people and like there's just constant misbehavior and like sexual comments like just teasing and bullying happening 24 7 in the classroom like we need help so we came in ran the program um over two weeks and at the end of the pilot i did a focus group and um i had a little boy tell me you know before i used to think it was right to force a girl at any cost but after you taught us my mind changed completely now, if a girl says, no, I won't force her, I'll accept it and move on. 
And what's more, I'm spreading consent among all the other boys in the school as well. So what we were really seeing was a sea change in behavior in the classroom. And even when we went back into the classroom um, five months later, the teachers, like they stood up, they gave us a standing ovation. They're like, these students are now the most empathetic, respectful kids of the entire school. We don't know what you did with them, but can you please train all the other teachers of the other grades on how to teach sex ed as well? And that moment was like really powerful for me because this is a country where this topic has not been discussed for 3000 years. Literally, like when, when I was talking to adults, like principals, teachers, CEOs of ed tech companies, none of them had ever had any sort of sex education. It's like completely taboo and rolled under the carpet. And, um, and to hear the openness and like the willingness from this like very low income, like, you know, not very well educated community towards this like really, you know, forward thinking solution, like was so amazing to me. And I was like, wow, if, you, if we can, if I create something that's actually changing, um, you know, kids and like creating the behavioral change, then people are actually open to it. Um, so I went on and I started selling this to schools and ed tech companies, but it was really hard. I mean, we're talking about something that people don't even understand what it is and like in the best case scenario and in the worst case scenario, they're so scared of the fallout from the, the community if, if we roll it out. Um, and so this is basically how I found myself here on stage at the Bombay Stock Exchange. Uh, pitching for seed funding for this this groundbreaking solution that like nobody has everyone's like scared to talk about but is the solution to this problem that they're facing in the country and so I finished this whole pitch right and I'm like waiting for feedback from the mentors and in the audience it's like all the startup accelerator mentors and and like the next day it's going to be investors flying in from all over the world and I finished the pitch I'm just holding my breath. There's silence. And one of the mentors just kind of raised their hand and she's like, what is that font you're using? She's, oh, she's just like, what, what are these slides? Like you didn't even put any animations on the slides. Like, I feel like you spent no time on this deck. Like my 10 year old son could have done a better job on this deck. Okay, does anyone else have any more feedback? Nothing. Okay, so I go home and I'm devastated. After pouring my heart and soul into my venture and into trying to change the world <laughs> and trying to convey this for funding necessary to, to change the country, and, you know, after having like given up my normal life in America, having sacrificed all my savings and my reputation, <laughs> like having raised money from my family um, and everything's on the line and to get this superficial feedback felt like it just felt like a blow. It was like, if people can't see or hear me, then why am I here? So I thought, OK, let me just give it my best go and let me leave and go back to the U.S in the next six months. So I did, so I gave it my best. I, you know, got whatever, a few more clients, customers, um, and I closed shop and I moved back to California. And a few months later, I'm sitting then at my, I'm at home, my parents' dining room table. It's like quiet, clean. There's like birds chirping outside. It's like, and I just kind of opened my computer and um, I see and there's an email from the largest corporation in India. And it says, Nilima, the work that you've been doing is revolutionary and groundbreaking. And we feel like it'll give us a competitive edge and we wanna license your program to 600,000 youth across every town and city across India through our platform. So just like that, um, 
they paid me, uh, you know, a decent amount of money and I got my solution out to half a million kids across every single town and city across India year on year where they would actually go in and they train the principals and the teachers on how to run this solution. So this is something that happened in three years. I just had some capital, friends and family, no connections in a foreign country, um, you know, no precedent of anyone having tried to do sex ed before. But I reached a scale that had not been reached by governments or NGOs, just with a team of three people. So how did I do this? So what I realized was that I had been following a feminine leadership paradigm inside a masculine ecosystem. And that had been the, that had been the whole like, weirdness the whole thing i had been following a leader feminine leadership paradigm inside a heavily masculine ecosystem and that's what i call goddess leadership so um so what is goddess leadership like what were the principles that brought me to this kind of quantum scale in such a short amount of time Number one, my vision chose me. And I was a channel for my vision to come through me. So what I believe is that, so I had the exact lived experience and cultural, like mixed cultural upbringing and venture knowledge. And it's like all of my experience brought me to this point where I was seated with this vision where I was like, I wanna create this company. Um, there wasn't, it wasn't like I tactically went out and I was like, let me think of like 15 different venture ideas and like choose one of them. It was very much linked to my lived experience, professional and personal, like I was really passionate about carrying this out. Um, and I think that that's an important distinction because I don't think, I think that if you're going to sacrifice everything to start a venture and take on that risk, there is something deeper there. There's something core there. It's almost like your vision chooses you. And it's important to recognize that as you're building it. So my insight here was that anchoring first in my vision and my ability to carry this out was so fundamental. So that means, what is the vision? My vision was sex education at scale. So when I'm going through accelerators, and as we know, getting tons of feedback and inputs and advice, advice from people, um, every time I have to make decisions, right? It's like um, investors are saying, hey, why don't you do a B2C just software solution? And my heart is like, that's not going to create the behavioral shift. It has to be a group-based program in the classroom. No, right? Um, someone says, uh, have you thought of, you know, have you thought of not doing it for the boys? Because that's just like, it's too hard. Like it's people are more amenable to it if you're just doing it for the girls. Is that is that why I started this? No, right? And so it was really important for me to be an integrity to what the vision actually is and was because that led me to the correct partners like this ed tech company and distribution channels where it would work. Um, number two, I created a container for others to join me in my vision. So um, a container, and I call it a container purposefully. So a container is a way for someone to engage with your big vision. So this is your product or service or your program, um, or indeed a fundraise is a container. So why not just call it a fundraise? I am holding the container. It's my container. I am deciding I'm raising 500K and I'm inviting people to join me in there. It's my party. Look how fun it is here. Look how great this is. You get to be a part of this if you join me. So 
same with selling the product. This is what I've built. This is the results that we get. Do you want to join me? Right. And I'll get into this a little bit later with like masculine and feminine energy dynamics. But to me, the vision being seated with the vision being like my vision chose me. I trust it. I trust it from the inside. That's feminine. And this container holding is your masculine. And we need both. You know, we need both to be um, to become magnets in our fundraising. But I'll get into that. Number three. So I have my vision, I've created my container, so I need to be seen and heard in order to become a magnet for values like people. And norm, like, see that I say magnet, like they're coming to me. And that's because the crucial thing is I'm letting myself be seen and heard. And so I'll tell you the story that after, soon after our first pilot, which you can imagine is like in like we did like a couple of schools. Like we did like a, that low income school. We did a high income school. We did like teacher training, right? We did a few pilots. And soon after that, all of a sudden I was, a real, I was on a reality show um, for social entrepreneurs in India, like an entire season of a reality show. And um, I was pitching live to 10 million live viewers across the country. So when I talk about goddess leadership or feminine leadership, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about quantum jumps. So it's like, because I had the courage to let my message be seen and heard in its in entirety and let myself be seen as the steward for this, I got that opportunity, which was, which is like way more visibility than just, you know, just like doing it in a linear way and just trying to push and shove and like work more hours and work 12 hours a day. Instead, I got an opportunity that immediately opened me up to 10 million people, right? So what we're always looking for here is how can we let ourselves be seen more and like try to grind less because that's not necessary. The more we let ourselves be seen, the, the quicker that things just jump in quantum speed. Are you guys feeling this so far? Thank you, I'm glad. Yes, 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 yes. Mm. So important, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So I'm gonna do, yeah, so I'm gonna do a little exercise with you um, all. So I'm going to put a few words on the screen and I want you to let me know in the chat box uh, how it feels in your body when I say these words. Pitching. Selling. You can just put the first word that comes to mind. Pushing it out, going hard. Convincing a customer. Converting a customer. Telling someone what he wants to hear. Exposed, stressful, not me, anxiety, energetic, forcing, vulnerable, manipulative. Exposed. All right, let's take a new set of words. Being yourself. Letting customers come to you where there's natural fit. Letting investors find you where there's respect. Letting investors stay far away where there isn't. Feel into this energy. Calm, empowered, aligned, self-awareness, genuine, grounding, flow, energizing, alignment. And it's important to note there's no right or wrong. This is your body's reaction to these words. Acceptance of longer timelines. So this is the difference between pushing versus receiving. So in ancient cultures like Indian and Chinese and so many ancient cultures, there's talk about feminine and masculine energy in our bodies, the yin and the yang. Um, 
and every single person, male, female, non-binary, everyone has both energies um, in our bodies. So the masculine energy, yang, is associated with right brain. So very logical, uh, very competitive, assertive, very, very practical and tangible. Uh, but more than anything, uh, right brain or yang is about out to in. It's about external validation. So it's like, let's look at all the data and make a decision. Let's, let's get feedback from people, right? Let's put it out there. Let's throw spaghetti at the wall. This is the yang. It goes on, it penetrates, it tries. Um, and, but trying in excess is pushing, right? But it tries, that's the yang. Yin, on the other hand, is the left brain. It's imaginative, it's collaborative, it's receiving others, it's heart-driven, it's intuitive. And so more than anything, so this is the source of your vision, but this is in to out. This is internally sourced. So this is the difference between being externally validated versus internally sourced. Do you feel me? And we have been taught forever how to be externally validated. But what happened to the feminine? What happened to your internal sourcing of your vision, the way you articulate it, right? The way you present yourself. Because you know what you're building from the inside also. Um, so what's happened is that we're doing both all the time. We're seeing what people think. We're checking in with ourselves. You know, we're building the idea at the beginning. We're putting it out there. But because there's such an excess of masculine energy, that's when it starts to feel stressful to sell because it's like, I need their validation. Like I need them to say, yes, I need, I need, I need. But when we consciously embody our feminine inside first, and it's like, wait, I'm voicing my truth. If they're in alignment, they'll say yes and they'll step in. That's when we become magnets. And that's when it becomes way easier and you create these quantum shifts. Thanks, darling. Great perspective shift. So that's when we become magnets is when we can embody our feminine side first. So the insight here for being seen and heard is that instead of pushing harder and working more hours and grinding and just staring at the screen, I let myself be seen and heard. I really allow myself to connect in a human way to each relationship and invite them into my container. Yes, and that requires work as well. That's where we get to uncover some of our own blocks and our own vul vulnerability around that. And that's the work, that's the inner work, but that's actually to me more fun than pushing and grinding into a, like a black box and feeling like I have to get validation. Um, so those are the three main goddess leadership principles, which is uh, my vision chose me and I'm stewarding it and I create a container for others to join me. And then I let myself be seen and heard and become a magnet for values aligned people. Um, let me know so far if you have any questions and shoot them in the chat box or let me know what you're feeling. Um, but I'm gonna go tactically a little bit now into what this means for a pre-seed or seed raise. Abby's like, can you go back one? Love it. Thank you. Yeah, it's like right here. I always drink so much water when I'm presenting. It's like so funny. Just downing bottles of water. Yeah. So basically, what does this mean for your pitch deck? And so this is the exciting part because this is where we really get to make it real. And I, so I run a three month accelerator called Pitch Lab and I work with pre-seed founders who are at that stage. Like I've never stewarded half a million or a million dollars before. Like, how do I go out and ask for that kind of money, right? And um, 
and purpose-driven founders who have these huge visions for the world. And so what happens, like, and I see so many pitch decks and like, I'm obsessed with this. Like, I just love looking at um, women's like visions to impact humanity and being like, this needs to be tuned up. This needs to be tuned up. <laughs> and it's like uh, micro alignment. So out of all the pitch decks that I see, um, here's like a few things that I see like in almost every single pitch deck um, that comes across my desk. So in the first one, um, my vision chose me. In the first few slides of your deck, this looks like not embracing the fullness of your big vision and not fully embodying and amplifying your uniqueness as the founder. And so in the problem opportunity slide, for example, so basically what's gonna happen is that if you have a systems change um, uh, you know, product, or even if like it's you're not going out with the with the mission of shifting your industry, there's stuff happening at the macro level that makes your solution extremely relevant and unique. Okay, and so for example, say that you're say you're this is like a totally random example. You're starting a platform um, to help people shift their diet so that like to prevent illnesses or something, right? So to you, it's just a platform to help people shift their diets. But what's actually happening in the industry at scale, like what's happening is that there's no preventative health care inside the healthcare industry. Like, um, you know, like whatever percentage, 90% of Americans like suffer from whatever, whatever chronic diseases. There's, um, and the solutions are, like are so hard for people to find or whatever, right? So we're going very big. We're going very big and we're not just starting with like uh, I'm starting a platform for whatever it's like we're really looking at this 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 industry is collapsing and we're coming in to build something new and the reason we're doing this one because it's true but two because what you're building as you raise more and more rounds is going to have so many more layers of impact to it so now it's a platform right but tomorrow you might be having multi-sector, you know, conversations with people and building a new industry or building a new piece of the industry. And that's what we want to see that because if I'm investing in you in, even in a pre-seed round, I want you to be a billion dollar company, right? And it's like, I know that you have all those layers of that vision. So if you can synthesize that into a few statistics early on, um, you're really starting the narrative with that bigger encasement. Number two, not fully embodying and amplifying your uniqueness as the founder. I see so many founders being like, um, uh, yeah, this is the platform. And like, yeah, we've, we've been managed to get like this many sales, you know, and we've managed to do this, but it's, and then, you know, the team slide is closer to the end anyway. It's like, oh yeah, by the way, this is who I am. Well, at the pre-seed stage, as you know, people are investing in you, the founder, um, and this is another place where you can just let yourself shine more. Like, remember that all of your lived experiences have led you to this point. So can you synthesize a few of those stories of when you lived through this pain point and how you overcame it? Because that's actually so powerful. And then you can say, you know, I went through this and there's like hundreds of millions of me's out there in the form of this demographic. Or if you don't want to use your personal story, like use the story of one of your users who's really experienced, you know, positive results from your solution. Um, because if you can really personalize that product market, so we call it product market fit, right? But if you personalize it in a story of one person, I'm never going to forget that story. And if you tell me there's 500 million people facing that deep pain point that this story is not unique to this person you've created a lasting impression on me in like the first few slides already um so number two holding a strong container um so when we're getting into the strategy side of the fundraising not holding a strong container looks like changing your fundraising amount because you're getting yeses and nos and people telling you 500 things right 
So changing your, your timeline for fundraising or your fundraising amount fluctuating based on how you feel that day, based on the conversations you've had. And like guilty, every, like this is not an easy thing to do, right? It's like, of course, but, um, uh, and another thing is changing your pitch deck endlessly, like tweaking it and tweaking it every time someone is like, what about that metric? Oh, I don't get that slide, right? <laughs> the guilt is real, yeah. And so what you want, so every time you're going in and you're like fiddling on your pitch deck, it's creating an unstable foundation in you. And you're like, oh, like that's changing. It's that's not a stable container, right? So what we want to do is you want to get that first round of feedback, like in a really good state of mind, you want to go through it and decide what you're going to put back into your deck. And then you want to codify that next level that version of your deck once and hold it, hold it for dear life. The stronger your container is, the quicker the money zips in. It just comes in, it responds to how anchored you are in your decision. Um, and of course, it's easier to do this in community. So in Pitch Lab, um, I've had founders come in and raise 500K in like two to four weeks, like no joke, because I do the first half day deep dive with you in Pitch Lab. And then it's like, we codify the next level version of the deck. And then because you're part of this like community, it's like, you know that, you, you know, you're being held to like holding that and like not changing them out. And so all you can do is just go out and have conversations in that energy and, and, and it, people respond and it comes in. Um, so sometimes you need a little bit of accountability here in terms of the amount you're raising or the timelines um, to, be, to be confident in this. And then finally, the last one about being seen. So a couple of quick things here is like, and by the way, like each of these things, I could literally do an hour long webinar on like each of them. And so this is like very much just the crust, like just a taste of, um, of how these things may play out for you. But a few common ones is like, you're not letting yourself be seen and heard because you believe that uh, there aren't enough people who will get it, who will receive your message. Like it's too complicated, like people aren't gonna get it. So let me water it down. So that's a false belief because actually anyone can get it. Anyone can get it, no matter how complex it is. I worked with a founder who was working in the health insurance industry, trying to create a product for self-employed people. Like that's literally the most complex industry there is. Um, and she came in with like 30 or 40 users into the accelerator. And in three weeks, she had partnerships with Kaiser Permanente and Covered California. And so it's really that anchoring and that articulate that ability to then, you know, human to human connect with the people in your network. Um, and also like the, the thing that we don't have the skills of the network to, to find the people who want to invest, that's also a false belief. And like going on a limb and I'm saying this is a false belief, like I've had black founders, I've had founders from like underrepresented areas, like not in San Francisco, like raise funding and scale their businesses, right? Because I really believe that, um, first of all, at the angel stage, like anyone can be an investor. Second of all, you don't need 500 people. You just need like a small group of people who are able to put in the checks. And then the other thing I believe is like the people who resonate with you are already in your field. Like they're already second, maybe you've second or third degree connections on LinkedIn, but it's like, you don't even see the people who are there until you're like, going for it and you're you're so confident and anchored in, in the message that you're bringing for each human connection um and pretty soon like you start seeing the people as well that you didn't see before when you go in with that conviction so the insight here shut off your mind take action consistently and then let people come to you in the right in, in divine timing um and then celebrate every single invest, like every single check, every single bit of money that comes in, because 
do not focus on the gap, focus on celebrating the creation of the outcomes. It's like, um, I got 10K, great, yes, it's happening, I'm doing it. I got 50K, I got this much, right? And it's everything that you receive is a validation for you, is a validation for you. And most people are gonna say no, right? But every single thing you receive is a validation of your vision. So yeah, so those are, those are some insights for, for those three steps. Um, do you guys have any thoughts so far? I'm almost done with the presentation, then you can ask questions. Um, but yeah, it's so like long story short, like the feminine approach works and it's just so much easier, <laughs> so much easier. And so I've had a founder come into my pitch lab program without a website or a pitch deck and we actually, so I helped her reframe the way she was talking about her solution. And this is a great story, actually. So she's, she has like business partners, like people she's been consulting for, people she's known for like years, but she's always like, there's this power dynamic there. It's always like such masculine energy. And she's like, I never feel like my voice is heard. And after we reframed her pitch, she went and she just like casually told the same dude about her idea. And he's like, that's amazing. Let's partner on this uh, for like a 500K business contract. So that funded like her first prototype of her, of her product. So it's like the energy in the room changed because she, she, was like, she was like, wow. Like she's like, I came in and it was like, I was the leader. I was the leader of the conversation. She's like, I didn't even mean to have a conversation with him, but it happened naturally, right? Um, and so, yeah, it should be natural. So just, yeah, there's like some cool results. And so collectively, like my founders have raised 3 million plus and on average they get 120 times the return on the tuition of the program, which is 5K. Um, but moreover, like, it's like you get the tools to pitch forever and then you can go raise your seed in six months. And I really think these are life skills of, um, of holding a container and, and deciding and deciding to hold this strong container and, and do it. Um, so yeah, this is a link for you guys. If you're interested in learning more, I can like put this in the chat box, but like, totally happy to take questions now but like yeah happy to have like a 45 minute call with anyone who's interested in learning more and applying these concepts to to your own venture if you're in a fundraise so i think we're doing great on time we still have 10 full minutes for questions Thank yeah, you. it does look it does look like you're doing great on time. And I just wanted to pop back in um, just to encourage people to um, go ahead and just uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Unless Nilima, you'd prefer they put the question in the chat. Yeah, since I mean, yeah, I think like with 25 people, we can. Um, you, there's I don't know if you guys want to like raise your hand or if you just want to unmute yourself and just ask. Let's see. Yeah, there's like a, I don't know if there's a raising hand thing. Yeah, just go ahead and ask. You can feel free to turn on your video and um, and and chit chat. But yeah, let me know in the chat box, like that was a lot. So I know you're processing, but um, if anything is coming up for you right now as you're processing, you can just put it in the chat box as well. And you know, Nilima, I saw a question earlier when you were speaking. You were talking about making the authentic connection on an individual level with different people that you're talking to. And as long as, you know, that connection is really authentic and powerful, that, you know, that can be a strategy in and of itself. And then someone asked, but how do you do that? You know, how do you actually make that connection be authentic and powerful at the individual level? So maybe you could speak a little bit more about that. Yeah, that's a good question. 
it's a practice. Um, I think what, to me, it's really about the anchoring of your vision. Like to me, it's, to me, it's really about like remembering that there's a reason why I'm doing this. And it's like, I didn't give up everything for nothing. Like there's a reason why I am doing this and it's so important and it's so sacred to me. And whoever you are, <laughs> however much money you have in your fund, you're not me. Like you don't have my experience. Like you don't have my magic. You don't know how to change things in the way that I know how to, right? And, um, and that's what's beautiful is like everyone has you, all of you, every single one of you, you have your own magic based on your synthesized lived experience. Like nobody is you. And to me, like that's the basis of human connection. I think um, like, I think it's, I think that's so, that's so great. Like when you can, when you honor that in yourself first, you have that, that anchoring and you show up into the conversation and you're having, you're, you're, you're building a relationship. You're inviting people into a, to a tea party with you, into your party. Like, this is who right. I am. This is what I'm doing. Um, stripping some of, I think, just bringing it down a little bit to that level. But. But, and I suppose maybe your container, you know, the, the bit about the um, inviting the people that you're talking to, to join the team, right? To help you in your, in your mission is a very different thing than, you know, pitching to someone, trying to get them to give you something, but rather you're, you know, inviting them to come have an experience with you kind of yeah. sounded like that's what I took away from the container I which yeah. definitely resonated with me personally because that is the fourth floor that's the whole point of it you know it's not it's not for me you know it's for all the members it is a collaborative thing you know like everyone that we're talking to we're inviting them to come be a part of what we are building like everyone on the fourth floor is building the fourth floor which yeah. I think is a feminine approach yeah. to something and same with investors. Like, I don't care who you are. You're, I'm inviting you into my container. Because the second that I'm going outside of myself, I'm losing myself and my energy is going to drain. And this thing is, you know, that takes a toll over time. So it's like, can you receive me? If so, then I receive you. And that's the, when you when you can actually do that authentically, like you guys, that's the magnet. People want that. They're like, you, as we know, like confidence breeds like people wanting to invest in you and be a part of it. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, how does it resonate with male investors? So actually this, when you strengthen your feminine, you're strengthening your masculine. So it's actually like we operate better in a male oriented ecosystem when we realize like what we're doing subconsciously anyway and are able to master it. So I actually like, it's like you're less swayed and like ups and downs because you're like, oh, I'm holding a container. I'm inviting people in. That is the masculine approach. That's what men do. Like that's what masculine energy people do. Um, it's just that we're learning it in the feminine way because like we've just never thought of it that way before you know how do you manage different attitudes and beliefs about pitch style so certainly you've created an energy it's very welcome I appreciate the perspective but sometimes you know if you walk into a room you may invite somebody into the container and they have a different idea of what the container should be um, do you have examples or thoughts on how to manage those challenges? Do you mean um, like an investor or like a teammate or co-founder? Is it someone who's in the company or outside of it? Outside of it. So if you're if you're going to go into a pitch and you started your story at the beginning, sort of the, the Bombay example exchange example, uh, which was great. Thank you for sharing the story. Yeah. I've found in various ecosystems, regionally, states, you, know, you go to different places, people have different trends and preferences on pitch style, content, how long, how short. Uh, so 
uh, at times that law of attraction takes place, right? And you, people get invited into the container and they're yeah. interested in what you're building, but there are other times where they want it packaged in the way that they are used to consuming something. How have you managed that with uh, your approach, the goddess approach? Yeah, totally. Um, so that's a really good one. So this is where we get tactical, right? So once you're very, very clear on the constraints of your vision and, and your container, what you're raising, whatever, it is really important to contextualize this for your audience. And so this is where when you're like, for example, when we were talking about the, like talking about the statistics and stuff, it's like being really relevant to like what they know, like what is the connection point for that audience and also like the format and stuff, like making it consumable for them. I think all of that is super important. And it comes after this work because it's not like you're putting yourself out. It's like the core is the same. And now we're just like putting it into different formats for different people to, to get it and receive it. That makes sense. Uh, I see people are hopping off. Um, just so you know, I put the link in the chat box for a free 45 minute uh, call with me if you're interested in deeping, uh, diving deeper into this for, for your venture or getting coaching from me. So I'm just going to put that in the chat box again for you guys. Well, thank you so much, Nilima. This was um, really, it was a paradigm shift. So I saw a comment in the chat about that. It was a mental, emotional reframe. Um, which, you know, can be really helpful. This is, this is a hard road that we are all on as women entrepreneurs. And, um, and definitely it was really helpful to, you know, take a beat and step back and think differently about why we're doing what we're doing every single day. And, you know, what is winning? And like, why have we chosen this road? So um, thank you very much for sharing all of that with the fourth floor. Thank you. And thanks for being such an engaged audience. And uh, thanks, Breen and Kat, as well. So.